are you aware that when it comes to WASI physics exams, depending on some of the questions or the areas where students pick questions from, they do better or they don't do well? Well, then let me welcome you to tonight's revision show on the Joy Learning Television. I am Anne Kwabi Albert, you can call me Pios, and I'm glad to take you through revision in physics as we prepare for the forthcoming WASI exams. So, like I started with, depending on the questions you decide to answer in the examination, you may do very well or may not do quite well. So I'm going to take my time and take you through some of the areas that if you should try very hard and you prepare for questions in that area, you are very likely to score very high marks. Tonight, we'll be focusing on light and wave phenomenon, which is question number 10 in the examination. And I'm very sure that by now you should know how to go about and what you really want to do to excel. But if you still have some goals to fill up, then I've got you covered for tonight. So before that, this show is an interactive one. You will be permitted to call in, phone in, answer some questions, and then if you get them correctly, then my, proceed, my producer will get you a reward or a gift. So we are going to look at the problem or the question of the night or of the day. And you try and note the questions down. You can take a screenshot and try your hands on the questions. Then in due time, I'm going to give you the chance to call or phone in and give answers. So let's look at the question or the problem of the day. There we go. The first question says, state the laws of reflection. That's question number one. AI, state the laws of reflection. And II says, a ray of light is incident on the plane mirror at a glancing angle of 60 degrees. So you should know what a glancing angle is before you can tackle this question. Then it says, determine the angle of deviation after reflection. Then 1B, it says, show by means of ray diagrams how a concave mirror forms a real and virtual image. So in this case, we are talking about diagrams. And in those diagrams, show us how a concave mirror is going to form a real image and how this same mirror is going to form a virtual image. Then C, I ah, it says, define the principal focus of a convex mirror. So tonight, we will take time and look at what concave mirrors are, what convex mirrors are. And you should be able to define what you call the principal focus of a convex mirror. Then our last question says, an object is placed 10 centimeters in front of a convex mirror of radius of curvature 15 centimeters. If the height of the object was five meters, find the height of the image seen in the mirror. So that is a problem of the day or question of the night. And get yourselves busy with this. Try to get other friends to on board. Tell them that Pios is on live joy learning television for the revision show in physics. And tonight we are looking at light and wave phenomena. So I'm going to run you through some key points as far as this section is concerned. Then we try and solve some questions. Then we come back for you to give me your solution to the problem of the day. So let's set the ball rolling. We want to start with reflection of light rays. When do we say a light ray has been reflected? Well, a light ray is reflected when it bounces back after or when it is incident on a surface. So I'm looking at bouncing back incident on a surface. When a light ray is incident on a surface, a number of things can happen. It could be absorbed. So the light ray could be absorbed, absorption. Now the light ray could refract. It would change direction and move along a different path. The light ray could even 
disperse, okay? Or, in this case, it may reflect. So, when it hits a rigid, a polished surface, the light ray bounces back. Then we say the light ray has been reflected. Now, depending on the surface it hits to, okay, the reflection may be a little bit different from other surfaces. So we go ahead and we look at the types of reflection. Here we look at specular reflection and diffuse reflection. Specular reflection and diffuse reflection. Let's begin with specular reflection. Specular reflection. This is also known as regular reflection. Regular reflection. Now, this occurs on a smooth surface. On a smooth surface. So when a light ray is incident on a smooth surface, the kind of reflection that occurs is regular or specular reflection. What happens is that the light rays that are incident at a given angle all reflect at the same angle. So you're going to have, let's say, a parallel beam of light incident on a smooth surface, producing parallel reflected beam of light. We can take an illustration of that. So let me get a surface, which will be my smooth surface. Then, let me say this is the back of the surface, okay? So this is a smooth, smooth surface. So I'm going to draw some rays of light that are incident on this surface. So I could have this, that, and that. Note this. And the light and wave phenomenon, you may be required to draw ray diagrams. Now, a ray diagram should have rays. A ray is a line with an arrow. So with this diagram, all these lines you can see here, they are just lines. Until so I put arrows on them, they don't qualify to become rays. If you draw a ray diagram and you don't have arrows on the lines in that diagram, you will not score any mark for it. So please be careful. So I put in arrows to show that these are rays. And these are parallel incident beam. So parallel incident beam. The beam is a collection of rays. Then we are saying that under specular reflection or regular reflection, the rays incident at an angle and it reflects at the same angle. So, I'm going to have this, that, and that with my arrows, like that. So this is also parallel, parallel reflected beam. When the reflection happens or occurs like this, then we say it's regular reflection. This reflection is very important in optical instruments. We talk about optical instruments, instruments whose operation primarily depends on light, availability of light. So let's say a microscope, a camera, a lens camera, photographic camera, a telescope, all these are examples of optical instruments. And for them, in their operation, Regular reflection is very, very important in their operation. So that is our diagram for specular or regular reflection. All right, we can go ahead and look at the next one, which is the diffuse reflection. In diffuse reflection, we have the rays incident on a rough surface. So on a rough surface. So rough surface or irregular surface. So it is also called irregular reflection. So somebody can say diffuse reflection or irregular reflection. Here, the rays are incident at a given angle or at an angle 
but at the end of the day, when they are reflected, they scatter. They scatter. So you have the rays incident at an angle on a rough surface, but the surface reflects them in a scattered manner. Then we say there is diffuse reflection. All right, let us look at an illustration of that. So once again, I can have a surface. This time, it's a rough surface. So let me go this way. So this is my rough surface. Then I'm going to draw my incidence beam. So I'm going to have this, that, and that. Then I'll show my arrows. Then how are they reflected? In a scattered manner. This way, this way, that way. So I have a parallel incident beam. Then I have scattered, reflected. beam. So, irregular or diffuse reflection occurs on a rough surface, such that you have a parallel incident beam, incident on a rough surface, and then the surface produces a scattered reflected beam. And this particular kind of reflection is common in our everyday lives. That enables us to see our surroundings. So it happens such that the way we are able to view or see things in our surroundings, most often it's due to scattered or diffuse reflection. So now, if I should ask you to maybe tabulate, okay, or give uh, two differences between specular reflection and diffuse reflection, you should be able to tell me the, the, the manner in which the reflection is done. In specular reflection, parallel reflected beam are produced, right? In diffuse reflection, scattered reflected beams are produced. You can say that specular reflection occurs on a smooth surface. Then diffuse reflection occurs on a rough surface. So for our revision, at least, we know what specular reflection is, we know what diffuse reflection is, and we know how they occur, and some differences. Let us move ahead and look at some other things. Now, I want to take time and look at reflection of light from a plane mirror. What's a plane mirror? A mirror with a flat surface, like maybe the dressing mirror. Or, well, very often in our homes, the mirrors that we use, we watch ourselves in to see whether we're looking good or not. They are plane mirrors. They have flat surface. As we go, I look at other types of mirrors too. So. When you stand in front of the mirror, the image you see of yourself in the mirror, I mostly argue that when you see, no one has ever seen himself or herself. Why? Because you stand in front of the mirror, facing the mirror, then you see someone, in which we say we are the people in the mirror. You see someone who is appearing as if the person is behind the mirror. Then we say we are the, the, the people or the person in front of the mirror, which I doubt in some way. So. The image that we see in the mirror, which most of the time we say it's our image, the image we say it's virtual. It is virtual because it is not real. How can you stand facing the mirror, then you see an image of yourself facing yourself, as if you are behind the mirror and you are looking towards your direction. So such images look as if they are formed behind the mirror. So, they are virtual images. They are virtual images. See, they are virtual. The image form is upright, which is true. You, you can't tell me that the last time you looked at yourself in the mirror, your head was down and your legs were up. No. You stand in front of the mirror, and then the image you see is standing straight 
upright, just like it is. So the image is upright. The image is largely inverted, and this is what we have to also take a second look at as we go along. What do you mean by lateral inversion? Stand in front of the mirror and lift your right arm. And there you see the image in the mirror lifting its left arm. You lift your left arm, and the image you see in the mirror is lifting its right arm. That's what we call lateral inversion. Your left becomes the right of the image, and your right becomes the left of the image. So, sometimes why I could give you some letters placed in front of a mirror, and you'll be asked to tell how, how, how the mirror is going to reflect those images or those letters. All right, then the image is of the same distance behind the mirror as the object is in front. Wow. That is it that if you stand in front of the mirror, let's say at a distance of 10 meters between you and the mirror, the image you will see to is 10 meters from behind the mirror. Wow. So the closer you get to the mirror, the closer the image is to the mirror. This particular property can be used to give a, a number of challenges or problems for us to solve. So you can be given a question based on this particular characteristic that when you have an object in front of a mirror, the distance between the object and the mirror in front is equal to the distance between the image and the mirror behind the mirror. So we take time and get a question too on that and see how we go about it. So I want to give you an illustration of lateral inversion. So sometimes, let me say, Y gives you a question. Y draws for you a mirror. So this is my mirror. This is the back of the mirror where I'm shading. And this is the front part of the mirror. Then some letters are put in front of the mirror. So this time I want to use plumbing. So P L U M B I N G. Plumbing. So plumbing is placed in front of the mirror like this. Then why could ask you how is the mirror going to reflect it? Here you are being tested on the images formed by a plane mirror being largely inverted. So I have plumbing on the paper like this. So I have plumbing. So let's have plumbing. So in the exams, when I give such a question, something like that, get your paper and write the word on a paper like this. Okay. Now you can trace these words behind the paper. So when you trace how they appear, that is how the mirror is going to reflect it. So let me try and see the tracing of the word plumbing. So I'm going to do that with my pen. And then I'll show you to the camera and then you'll see. So I have this here. Have the next letter. I just want to show you how it will show like. Have the next letter. Have the next one. Maybe try it at home. Write plumbing on the paper. Then trace behind and let's see what happens. Then have the next one. Then I have this. I'm almost through. Last but one letter. Then I'm on the last one. So by now you should be finishing with yours. So I have traced it. And let's see how it was plumbing like this. Now I have it like this. You see? And this is what we call lateral inversion. This is how 
your mirror is going to show this. And that is what we mean by images formed by plane mirrors are largely inverted. Good. So from what I have here, I can try and see if I can put something there for you to see how it appears. So I have this one there, like that. I have this one here, like that. Then I have that, I have that, I have that, I have that there, this, and that. So you see, this is what we mean by lateral inversion. It looks like the G here, which is the last letter here, from the mirror, it will be appearing to be like the first letter in this case. Wow, that's what you mean by lateral inversion. So we are good to go. Let's move on with our revision. I hope you are enjoying the lesson and then you are taking note of what is going on. All right, I think that we can look at a question or two based on the properties or the characteristics that we have looked at. The first question says that a man 2.2 meters tall stands in front of a plane mirror. What is the shortest length of mirror that will enable him to see his full length image? His full length image. His full length image. All right. So, in other words, to try and illustrate this, I can get a mirror. This way. Very tall, or a long one. Then let me put a man who is also as tall as the height of the mirror there. So let me put this man here. He must be a very tall one. So I have the man whose height is just like that of the mirror, in front of the mirror. Now, if this man is going to see a full length image of himself in the mirror, then rays of light must move from his head to the mirror, reflect from the mirror into his eyes. Then rays of light must move from his feet, also reflect from the mirror into his eyes. That is to say, from his head, Rays should move to the mirror and they should reflect into his eyes. So let me try and put, let's say, to this and that. Let me get a normal. So let me say this is my normal. To so raise incidents, get into his eyes. Let me pick also rays from his feet, hit the mirror this way, reflect also into his eyes. Like that. So if you look critically, carefully, you will realize that the portion of the mirror that's being used is just from here to here. These are the portions where you have the rays that are reflecting into the man's eyes. So he's only seeing himself because of these rays, these rays that are reflecting into his eyes. And this portion of the mirror is being used. And this is almost like half of the size of the mirror. So it is a principle that if you want to see a full length image of yourself in the mirror, then you need a mirror that is at least half of the length. So if the man is 2.2 meters tall, then he needs half of the height or his height. A mirror whose length will be just half of the man's height. So you're going to get 2.2 over 2, half of it. You give me 1.1. So the shortest length 
or the least length of mirror that will be needed by the man will be 1.1 meters. So if I give you a question like this in the exams, you don't really bother. Look at the question. The question is asking you to find the height of mirror that a man height to be given uh, needs to see a full length image of himself. Just take half of the person's height. But sometimes why it might be tricky. Why it might give you rather the, the, the maybe the portion, the length of mirror that is helping the man to see a full length image of himself. And you'll be asked to maybe calculate or guess the height of the man. The image, if I need just half of the mirror's length, okay, half of the man's length should be the length of mirror that I need to see my full length image. Then if I multiply that one by two, it should give me the full height of the man. Good. Let's look at the next question. This question is a past question. While seeing November 2013, question 27. An objective test question. Very nice one. A student stands five meters from a tall vertical mirror and sees in a mirror the image of a picture two meters behind him. So the student stands under the mirror, looking into the mirror. Then there is a picture behind him. So the student sees an image of the picture from the mirror. Good. He then walks three meters closer to the mirror. What is the distance between the image of the picture and the student at his new position? So see, this question is testing our knowledge on the property that says that the object or the image seen in a plane mirror is of the same distance from the mirror behind as the object is in front. So the object distance in front of the mirror, between the object and the mirror, is the same as the distance between the image and the mirror, that's but behind. So we will take our time and try and illustrate this. Put this in a diagram form and see how we can go about it. So it says that the train stands five meters from a tall vertical mirror, sees in the mirror the image of a picture two meters behind him. So let me illustrate that one and let's see. So let me put my mirror there in the middle. So I have a mirror here. This is the back of the mirror. Let me put a student in front of the mirror. This time between the student and the mirror, according to the question, is five meters. So let me put one of my students here. <laughs> Then let me show the distance between the students and the mirror to be five meters. Then the student sees an image of a picture that is behind him, two meters behind him. So I can get a picture. Let's get a picture somewhere. Maybe some pictures of some. Mm, something nice. Let me put something there. Something there. Okay. So that's a picture. And the picture is two meters behind my student. So two meters. Now, note that we are saying that distance between the object and the mirror equals distance between the image and the mirror behind. So it means that in this case, I'll have the image of the student. Maybe like that. Also, five meters. Like that. Behind. Then I'll have the image of the picture. Also, two meters behind. So you see, 
Now, if I want the distance between the student and the image seen, then you need to get the distance from here all the way to where the image is. So like it would be 5 plus 5, 10, plus this distance here 2, which would be 12 meters. But the question didn't end there. The question now says, the student now decided to move to a second position, which is 3 meters forward. So now let me get to my student at second position here. So this is position 1. So he comes to a second position. This is position 2. And if he has moved 3 meters forward, this time between him and the mirror used to be 5 meters. Now he has moved 3 meters forward. So now between the student and the mirror, it will be 2 meters distance. So now I have a distance here of 2 meters. So 2 meters. It means that the image of the student 2 will move forward. So let me see here. So this is position 1, this is position 2. And the image to half a distance, two meters between the image and the mirror. So now, between the student and the mirror, the, the, the picture here, the distance now, what will it be? From here to where the student is now. Don't forget, between the student and the picture was two, the, the distance was two meters. Then he moved three meters ahead towards the mirror. So the distance now will become five meters. So between the student now at position two and the picture will be five meters. So in the same way, between the students here now and the picture, you have five meters. So now the question is asking us to find the distance from here. Watch this. That's where our turning point is. So now the distance between the image seen and the student. So the student is now here and the image is down there. Oh. So let's pick the distance again. Good. So what will the distance? Check it for me. Now, from here to there is the two, right? Then, what again? From here to there is another two meters. And then, from here to there is a five meters. So, what is the distance between a student and the image, the picture, okay, the image of the picture seen. You should be able to get the answer by now. You should be able to get the answer by now. Mm -hmm. So let's go to the possible answers. It says 14.0 meters, 12.0 meters, 11.0 meters, 9.0 meters. If I calculate, I'm going to get 2 plus 2, so 2 plus 2, which is 4, plus 5, which give me 9. So our answer will be 9 meters. 9 meters. So that would be the distance between the image of the picture and the student at his new position at his new position. I am sure you have understood what we have done. So at his new position here, two plus two, four, and distance from here to there, like you as five. Like you as five. So we can move on with our lesson. All right. Reflection of light from plane surfaces. So now, we just pick generally a plane surface. A surface 
that is flat, and rays or a ray of light is incident on it, how is the reflection done? Then we look at something that will help us to answer the questions in the problem of the day. So let me take a, a flat surface, which I'm calling a plane surface. So this is the back of this surface. I'll show a normal to the surface. Then you have a ray of light incident on the surface, this way. I have another ray that reflects from the surface, that way. So this is called the incident ray. This is called the reflected ray. Now, between the incident ray and a normal is an angle I. I is called angle of incidence. Angle of incidence. Between the normal and the reflected ray, there's an angle, R, and R is called angle of reflection. Now, between the incident ray and the flat surface, there's an angle too. And between the ray that reflects and the flat surface, there's an angle. These angles I'm denoted with J are called glancing angles. Glancing angle. Now, assuming if the ray of light incident on the plane surface could go through the surface, then it would continue in this direction. I'm going to show with the short. That's just this way. It could have gone through that way. But it didn't do that. It reflected. So there is an angle between where the ray could pass and where it's passing down. This. This angle is D. It's called angle of deviation the angle of deviation so we have the angle of incidence the angle of reflection the glancing angles and angle of deviation how do we get the angle of deviation if you want to calculate from a diagram i plus r plus D should give us 180 degrees. Why? All these angles are angles of the straight line. From here all through to here. They are angles on a straight line. All of them. So I plus R plus G plus D. From the laws of reflection, one of them says that the angle of incidence is equal to the angle of reflection. So I could say I is equal to R. If I is equal to R, then I plus R, this whole thing becomes this. Instead of R, I'm going to put I in its place. So now, instead of R here, I put I there plus D is equal to 180 degrees. I'm going to get 2i plus d is equal to 180 degrees. I'm making d the subject. So d is going to give me 180 degrees minus 2 times i. So the angle of deviation is equal to 180 degrees minus 2 times the angle of incidence. So I think I've given you a clue to solving one of the questions in the problem of the day. And you should be able to solve that. So we can move on.
we have dealt with plane surfaces, flat surfaces. We look at plane mirror. Not all mirrors are plane. Some mirrors have a curvy surface. They are curved at the surface. We call them curved mirrors. Curved mirrors. So when you look at how these curved mirrors also undergo reflection. We have two types of curved mirrors to discuss at your level. The first one is what we call concave mirrors. Concave mirrors. Then we have to call convex mirrors. At the end of the day, I will try and tell, show you what we use at home that can qualify to or work or illustrate a, both a concave mirror and a convex mirror. Okay, so let's go on. So let's look at concave mirrors. Concave mirrors are also called converging mirrors. Converging mirrors. To converge means to meet at a point. So we are going to converge at this point, maybe at the school's physics lab. We're going to converge there. We're going to meet there. So, why do we call a concave mirror a converging mirror? A converging mirror. Concave mirror is also called a converging mirror. Why is it so? Well, let me give a diagram for that. So this is a diagram of a concave mirror. And look at this carefully. This is the reflecting surface. which is the polished surface, and the back is where I've seen it. There's a line, I'm just reminding you of it, called the principal axis, which we know by now. So this is the principal axis. Whereas in the flat or plane mirror, we had a normal, this is, we have the principal axis. Now, what happens is that, when you have rays of light that are parallel to the concave mirror, they are parallel to the principal axis. So I have rays of light that are parallel, so the principal axis. So these are principal axis. Then I get rays of light that are parallel to the principal axis. So I pick one, and usually two, they should be close. So this is incident on the mirror. The mirror reflects it. To this point here. If I have another ray of light, maybe coming from here, incident on the mirror surface, the mirror reflects it. This point here is called the principal focus. So you can see that any ray of light parallel to the principal axis. That is incident on this concave mirror. It's reflected to a common point to meet at this point F called the principal focus or the focal point. Because of that, a concave mirror is also called a converging mirror. So a concave mirror is also called a converging mirror because light rays that are parallel to the principal axis, when incident on the concave mirror, are reflected to a common point. They are reflected to meet at a common point called the principal focus. Hence, a concave mirror is also called a converging mirror. Then we can quickly look at a diverging mirror or a convex mirror. So a convex mirror is also called a diverging mirror. A diverging mirror. A convex mirror. Why? To divert means to move away from a point. So we all met at a point. Maybe the school's physics lab. Now we want to divert to our classrooms. We move away to our classrooms. Let me draw a convex mirror. So that's a convex mirror. This is the polished face and this is the back of the mirror. So you can now see the difference between the diagrams, the concave and the convex. So this is the back. The back is the one I've shaded this way. And this is the polished surface here. 
now I still will have I will still have a, a principal axis. So this one two principal axis, synonymous to the normal and imaginary line that goes through like that. The pole of the mirror is somewhere here. If I have light rays that are parallel to the principal axis, to so this way, and maybe this way, also here. When they are incident on the mirror surface, what happens? It reflects them to appear. Here, the word appear is very important. It reflects them to appear as though they are moving away from a common point. Like that. So these rays, this one, that have been reflected, they appear to be moving away from this common point here, F, the focal point, or the principal focus. So because a convex mirror reflects light rays parallel, so this one, this is an incident ray, incident ray. It reflects light rays parallel to the principal axis that are incident on it to appear. If you give a definition of why it is a, why a convex mirror is called a, con, a, a, a diverging mirror and you don't bring the word appear, appear, you will not get a mark because it is not actually through. It doesn't reflect the rays of light that are parallel to the principal axis to, to move away from a common point. No, it reflects them to appear as though they are moving away from a common point. So because it does that, we call the convex mirror also a diverging mirror. A diverging mirror. Good. So we're going to spend some time to look at the images formed by both concave and convex mirrors. So what kind of images are formed by concave and convex mirrors? We're beginning with the concave mirrors. What kind of images do they form? How do we trace the images formed by concave and convex mirrors? We have rules regarding that, and we have been able to go through that even on the Joy Learning Television channel. It's on YouTube, and you can just search for a lesson on spherical mirrors, and you find those rules here. I'm going to apply the rules to draw the diagrams to give us a, a, a recap to, to freshen our memory. So. I like to start with when the object is at infinity. When we say the object is at infinity, it means the object is far from our sight. We cannot see the object. It's far away from us. We can't see it. And probably because of its size, rays of light are moving from that object we cannot see. And they are incident on our mirror. And the mirror is able to form an image of that object for us to see. So we will draw, as usual, a concave mirror. I try to see the back of the mirror. I show principal axis. I try to take some rays that are parallel or coming from the object. So I take a light ray coming from the object, incident at the pole. And the rule says that if you have ray of light incident at the pole, it should reflect at the same, making the same angle with the principal axis. So, we can go back like that. Then I can have a ray of light. It's coming from an object from a far distance. So, it could just incident on the mirror somewhere. So, I could have maybe one like that on the mirror. Then it reflects.
Okay. So you have this one coming. You have this one here. This is where they are meeting. Note, in these diagrams, where our race meets, that's where the image is going to be. So this becomes my image. Let me use I for it. Image I will be there at this point, F, and this point will be C. Take note of these. This is the pole of the mirror, P. This is the principal focus, F. This is the center of curvature, C. Distance between principal focus and P should be the same as between F and C. So when the object is at infinity, so I will say, Rays from a distant object. So when the object is at infinity, it will form an image at F. I can look at the characteristics of the image formed. The image formed is inverted. It is turned upside down. That's one. So you said the arrow is looking downwards. Turned upside down. Number two. The image is formed in front of the mirror. Whenever you have radar diagrams and mirrors, or spherical mirrors are forming images, and the image is in front of the mirror, that image is a real image. So the image is real. Now, if an object that we cannot see from afar is able to form an image, or the mirror is able to form an image of that object from a very far distance that we cannot see, then it must be a huge object. So we say the so comparing the size of the object, the size of the image formed, we we'll say that the image has a smaller size than the object. Therefore, we say the image is diminished. When you say it is diminished, then it means that it has got a, a smaller size. The size is smaller. It's smaller than the object. Smaller than the object. So very soon we'll be taking a break. We'll take a breather so that we can all try and freshen up and then we come back. So let me pick the last thing to do before we go on our break. When the object now has moved forward. So you see, in this diagram, the object is at infinity, cannot be seen. In the next diagram, the object is coming behind C, or we call it beyond C. So when the object is in view, we can now see the object. And let us try and see the kind of image it will form quickly before we take a breather. So the object is now beyond C. All I for C is 2F because the distance between F and the pole, like I showed earlier on, between F and the pole, the same, the distance between F and the pole. So let me show this. Let me use a different color that to be. That's what we are standing. So let me use the green and see. Good. So between F and the pole, a small F. And between C2 and F, the same distance. So if I get from C to F, it's to P. So it's F plus F, which is 2F. So another name for C is 2F. Okay. So now I'm looking at objects behind or beyond C, or 2F. Quickly, 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 then we can take a break. So as usual, this is my concave mirror. Let me get my principal axis. So now, the object can be seen. So I'll draw an object that can be seen. Okay. The rule says when you have a ray of light 
from the object parallel to the principal axis this way, it should reflect through F. So I'm going to put F somewhere there. But if I have a ray of light that is passing through C, so I should have C somewhere there, which I'll show, it should reflect back along the same path. So I have C here, or 2F, then I have F here. Where are the rays of light mating? Here. So this is my image formed. This I. So I is our image formed. Good. I is our image formed. Like that. Good. So you can see that in this case, looking at the image characteristics, so image characteristics, you're going to get one. The image is in front of the mirror, which is true. So it's real. The image is turned upside down, so it's inverted. Looking at the size of the image and the size of the object, these are objects. We say the image is smaller than the object, which is true. So it is diminished. And of course, it is formed between F and C. At this juncture, we take a breather, we relax for a while, and then we come back. Stay tuned. See you shortly. Did you know that examination malpractice can lead to poor grades? As a result of this, you will lose trust in yourself and will not be able to perform well in any future assignments and tests. So, I'm here to give you simple tips on how to avoid examination malpractice. So let's talk about the do's in examination hall. One, bring everything you need into the examination hall. It may sound simple, but a lot of stress can be avoided by making sure you have everything you need to do in the exam. Make a checklist the night before each exam, then go through it before you leave home, and then again before entering the examination hall. Two, read the whole paper before writing anything. One of the most important exam preparation tips to dwell in during the run-up to exams. Read every question before you start writing anything. Don't get stuck in straight away. Read a paper from the start to finish at least once before you begin writing. 3. Do the easiest question first. There is no reason to do the question in order they are printed in the exam. Firstly, getting the first question done well will help you calm you and get you focused for the rest of the exam. Secondly, often you will get an easy question done quicker so you will be ahead of schedule from the start. 4. Revise, revise and revise again. The night before the exams is not the time to be trying to get your head around new concepts. Some students read and forget part of the information during exam. This is why you have to keep revising till the day or morning of the exams. 
Alice is one of the steady habits of highly successful students. Once you have become so conversant with your revisions, little or a slight pause will only be required for you to pre-collect the appropriate information. 5. Ask the invigilator questions. If you are stuck on the meaning of a word or can't understand what a question requires you to do, put your hand up and ask the invigilator who is supervising the exams. More often than not, they will help you or point to you in the right direction. 6. Look at the marking scheme. Keep an eye out for the marking scheme that shows how many marks have been awarded for each part of a question. If there are only small amounts of marks going for a part of a question, refrain from giving it the majority of your time. Instead, answer questions with higher marks. 7. Cross-check answers. You must check all answers before submitting your answer sheet to the invigilator. You should keep the last 15 minutes before the final bell to cross-check your answers. A thorough revision of every answer is necessary as it will help you to identify the errors and make the necessary corrections. 8. Think about the consequences of malpractice. Ever heard the saying, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom? Always remember, there is punishment for people who are caught cheating. There you have it. Believe in yourself, prepare well and you will come out with flying colors. My name is Tina and I am your examination coach. Keep watching Joy Learning and follow us on all our social media platforms. Till I come your way again, shine on. Joy Learning. Keep learning. It's time to wish your loved ones well on that special occasion. Is it the birthday or anniversary of your child, friend, classmate, your schoolmate, your teacher, or non-teaching staff of your school? The all-new JL Birthday Wish by Ghana's number one educational TV channel hits your regular classroom screen. And as usual, it is time for Jack to play and have fun. It has been made easy for you, and this is how. Send a picture of your loved ones. Add their names, school, and location, and a heartwarming birthday the message and finally follow us on official joy learning tv on instagram like the jl birthday wish post and tag five friends send it to our whatsapp line 0247-108-738 and voila your birthday wish will be aired on joy learning tv and all our social media platforms learning is made fun with the jl birthday wish joy learning keep learning It's time to wish... Your oral health tip for today is brush your teeth regularly, flossing every other day, use soft or medium brushes, Use toothpaste that contains fluoride in them and change your brush every three months and visit your dentist twice every year. Treat your mouth well so that your mouth will treat you well. It will enhance your self-confidence and help you eat and grow well. to revise for your wasi, then Joy Learning has everything you need in place. Yes, we are back with the 2023 revision show for SHS3 learners. Don't worry, your favorite question of the day section wasn't left out. And oh, you can engage with your facilitators during live TV lessons, ask questions, and get real-time feedback in the comfort of your own space. The 2023 revision show for SHS learners shows every Monday to Friday at 7.30 p.m. right here on Joy Learning. Joy Learning. Learning is so fun. Joy Learning. Keep learning.
welcome back. So we're looking at images formed by concave mirrors or converging mirrors. We looked at uh, when the object is at infinity and then when the object is beyond C. Now we can move on to look at when the object is at C. So when the object is at C, what happens? I want you to notice, take notes of what we are doing. There is a trend that is emerging. Once you know the trend, you will be able to recollect what the diagram is like and the image characteristics, and then you give answers to that in exams. So now the object is at C. It was at infinity, we couldn't see it. It moved forward a little bit, it's now beyond C. Then now we got it now at C. So I'll draw my converging mirror or concave mirror and draw my principal axis. Then let me put an object at C. So this is C, same as 2F, the same. So the rule says we should take a ray of light parallel to the principal axis. And when we do that, it should reflect through F. It should reflect through F. To go, I think I need a blue line and not and the black one. So take a blue one because you are not using actual distances. You have to be careful when you are drawing. So I have F there. Then now because. The object is at C. You cannot take a ray of light from C passing through C to meet the mirror. No. Therefore, you have to use the other where we are going to use the ray through F to the mirror like that. So ray of light should move through F to the mirror. So from the object through F to the mirror. Mind you, I'm showing my arrows. Then we're saying that it should reflect its parallel to the principal axis, like that. And this is where they are meeting. And where they meet, I'm going to find my image there. This is the image I. Now, if you take a critical or careful look at this diagram, the object and the image are at the same place. So the object is at F, 2F or, or C, and the image too is at C, the same place. You can look at the image characteristics. And the first one, it's inverted, so the image is inverted, it's turned upside down. Second thing is that the image is real, it's in front of the mirror, so it is real. But in this case, look at it, it's of the same size as the object. The image is of the same size as the object. In the first two cases, the image was diminished. In this third case, the image has attained the same size as the object. Forward, ever, backward, never. So in the next case, it's very likely the image will be bigger than the object because it's like the image size is, is growing. So the object was at infinity. It came closer beyond C or behind C. It's now at C. So now it's going to move between what? C and F. In the next case, it should come to F. 
and then maybe the last one is go between F and the pool, which is here, P. So let's move on quickly. Object between C and F. So as usual, we will draw array diagram starting with the convex mirror, sorry, concave mirror. Then the why should you do that? Okay. The principal axis. Okay, that's good. So object between C and F. So I have I need to get C somewhere. I need to get F to somewhere and put the object between them. Of course, the pull of the mirror is somewhere here. I think the size is too much. Okay. Then, this time we go back to our usual practice. Whenever you have the object there, we pick a ray of light that is parallel to the principal axis. I will draw my F, don't worry. You see, it should pass through F. So it's going to pass through F like that. So F will be here. Then I'll show my arrow. Then when the ray of light is go going through C, what happens? This is go through C to hit the mirror and it will reflect through the same path. I pick it from the object through the mirror like that and I'll put C there so as you go hit the mirror come back to the same path now what do you do we try to trace and see what happens to our race so like that and this one too moves like that Okay. This way. So I'm drawing it for you to see that you can also draw it yourself. In this case, this is where they are meeting. So the image will be formed at that point. See. This is our image. These are objects. So then we can look at the image characteristics. The image is in front of the mirror, this side, so to be real, it's inverted. So you see real and inverted happens or occurs in almost all the diagrams we've drawn so far. The image is real, the image is inverted. We keep writing that. But in this case, look at the size of the object and the, the size of the image. The image is now bigger than the object. When you have an image that is bigger than the object, we say the image is magnified. So the image is magnified and it's beyond C. It's beyond C. So now, what happens in the next diagram? The object moves from where it is to F. And remember, when we began at first, the object was at infinity and the image was formed at F. So now that the object is only going to, going to get to F, once it gets to F, then the image too will be. So you see now, there's no other place for it to be here behind C. It goes away from our sight. So say it is at infinity. And that diagram is so similar to this one, only that when we try to make the rays we project them to meet, they don't meet at a common point. 
So we didn't have an image being formed in our site, but the image will be formed at infinity. That's a nice diagram. So the object is at F. I'm going to draw. I my mirror this is the pool this is F and this is, this is C so I put an object at F. So as usual, I'll pick a real flag that is parallel to the principal axis. It reflects through F. Like that. Then I pick one now go through C. Good. Then my arrows. So it goes, reflects to the same part. Now, because these ones are not really meeting, to give us an image, you say the image is at infinity but we can also guess looking at the trend of image sizes we are getting I can say that the image this image here I can say the image is real why because it looks like possibly the image will be formed in front of the mirror so it's real I can guess, and I will be correct, that if in the first two instances we had diminished images, then the image became of the same size as the object. Then afterwards it became bigger. Then this one should be bigger. So I can say the image will be magnified. Of course, so far all the real images are inverted. So this one I can say the image is inverted. Inverted here means it's turned upside down. Then, the next thing is that this object will now move between F and the pole. And this is a unique diagram that if you are asked to draw an exam, should recollect it with ease. In all the diagrams, the images are real. They are inverted. They are formed in front of the mirror. But in this case, Something very interesting happens. Something very, very interesting happens. Let's look at it. So, the object is now between F and the pole. I draw my concave mirror. I show The principal axis, we show F, then we show C, then we have the object maybe here. Now because it's the pole is also here, so I show P, the pole. So this is my object, O. So, if I have a light ray that is parallel to the principal axis from the object parallel to it, it says it should pass through F. So we reflect and it goes through F. But if it is going through C, like this, then it goes and reflects through the same path. But look at it. If I should continue with the ray like this, the meteor. 
So my image will be formed here. So this is our image. This is the first time that the concave mirror is forming an image that is erect. And this is the first time the image is formed behind the mirror. This image is called a virtual image. So the image is a virtual one. And it is upright or erect. Upright or erect. So I can look at image characteristics. The image formed is virtual. The virtual image is formed behind screens. It's behind the mirror. But it is upright. It's erect. This virtual image in this case, see, it is bigger than the object. So it is magnified or it is enlarged. Magnified or enlarged. So these are the images that are formed by a concave mirror. And you should have these diagrams in mind. Now, when you're asked, draw a diagram to show how a concave mirror can be used as a, a makeup mirror, a dressing mirror. Which other diagrams are you going to choose? Note that to make up means to cover something that you don't want it to be shown. So your face or where, whichever part of the body you want to do make up on, when you see it in the mirror, should be enlarged, should be big. So that you can really close those pores. Number two, you can't be doing makeup when you are turned upside down. Right? So in doing the makeup, you need a mirror that will keep you upright, erect. So it's obvious the kind of mirror I'm supposed to, the diagram I'm supposed to choose. If I'm supposed to draw a diagram, that will show how a concave mirror could be used as a makeup mirror. All right, that's good. I hope you are following the lesson. So, there are these things I want you to note. The first one, as the object gets closer from infinity, the real images formed move further away from F. Very important. Very important. If you are able to keep these strengths, you will not have much difficulty. Let me just use the colors to give you a picture of it. So, we have our principal axis. Then let me show the pool. Let me show principal focus F. Let me show C, center of curvature or 2F. Now, in the first case, we had the object at infinity. So let me see my object is here. We had the image being formed here at F. It was diminished. Let me pick a different color. We had the object move forward to come behind C here. Then we saw the image come between so the object was somewhere here. Then the image came between C and F. Then we saw the object move to C. Then the image too was at C, having the same size. 
So maybe because it's an image and they are the same place, let me use. Short dashes. Good. Then we saw that the object moved to between C and F. So let me pick this color. So the objects. So then the image went behind C. You see. Then the object moved. So for this one to let me try and just make them. Good. Then, when the object finally gets to F, the image goes away. Infinity. Then, when the object now moves, between F and the pool, the image becomes a virtual image. Wow. So that's it. So one is to one, two is to two, three is to three, four is to four, five, is to five and six is to six. So it says that as the object moves from one to two to three to four to five to sixth position, the image moves from first, second, second, third, fourth, fifth positions. Then in this case, it becomes a virtual image. Once you know some of these things, you don't have a problem. And check it, the images diminished, diminished of the same size becomes enlarged. And it's enlarged. Very important. Real, 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 real images, they form a virtual image. Let us look at how a convex mirror will form images. For convex mirrors, they form only one type of image, irrespective of the positioning of the object. No matter where the object is placed in front of them, they will form only one type of image. So that one should also be quite easy for us because it's just one image they will form. So this is a convex mirror. Let me draw my principal axis. Let me put an object in front of this mirror and let's see what it will do for us. So this is my object. I pick a ray of light. Parallel to the principal axis like this. It reflects it to appear as though it's coming from F. Then I have a ray of light that is going through C, so all uh, like that.
So C What are they meeting? Can you see? Yes, I can see. I hope you can see what they're meeting. Good. So there. And that's our image. So we can look at the image characteristics. The image is behind the mirror. Can you see that? So this image is a virtual image. So virtual. This image is upright, it's standing upright. So it's erect. So you see upright or erect. Comparing the size of the object with the size of the image, the image is smaller. Than the object is behind the mirror. A practical example is the side mirrors of a car, the driving mirrors, and the sides of the car. You will see that when you see a car behind in the driving mirrors, that car or that vehicle looks smaller than the actual vehicle behind it. Yes. That car you see too is not turned upside down. You don't see the tires of the car moving in the air. <laughs> the driver's head turned upside down. No. It's so on the road as it's supposed to be. So it's upright, but it is diminished. It's smaller. So one use of a, a convex mirror is that it is used as a driving, a car driving mirror or a car side mirror. Why? Because it produces erect images all the time. All the time, the images are erect, they are upright. And then it also gives us a wider field of view. It helps you to see the, the entirety of the object, how big it is, by sometimes pulling, it looks like it pulls the object far away from you. So sometimes in the driving mirror they say, objects are closer than they appear, because it tries to take the object a little further away from you, so that you can see how big the object is, and in doing so, it will appear, it will be closer than it appears in the mirror. So, that is it. So by now, when you are giving questions, you should be able to use your knowledge gained to solve those questions. I want to give you a practical illustration. At home, get a spoon. So I came with a spoon. This is the spoon I want to use for the practical illustration. This metallic spoon has two faces, the back, then the front side. Try looking at your face with both sides of the spoon. If I go this way, I can see myself in this spoon, but I am turned upside down. I can see my head down. <laughs> and I can't really see myself being so clear. If I go backwards, I'm a little bit smaller. If I come closer, I'm quite bigger. If I turn it this way, now I can see myself really so clear in, and this time I'm standing upright. So this side of the spoon facing me is behaving like a convex mirror, a convex mirror. At all the times when I look at myself in it, I appear upright straight and I'm, I look smaller, I'm diminished. But this side facing me now, where you used to scoop, is behaving like a concave mirror. I'm turned upside down. I see my head turned down and I see my legs up like this. So try this at home and to give you a better understanding about concave mirror, this side facing me, convex mirror, this side facing you. So that's something practical that you can do. So you can see that what they are doing is not just uh, abstract, but then it's something that is practical. It's practical. So I'm giving you an assignment. What are some of the uses of concave and convex mirrors? I've spoken about the convex mirror is used as 
and it's car side mirror. Fine, that's okay. There could be other uses. There should be. Concave mirrors too have other uses, but they have their own uses. What are some of the uses? It might appear in the next challenge or question of the day. So look up that and then let's see what we will find out. Now it's time for us to work some examples. After I've gone through one or two examples, I'm going to open the phone lines, give you the opportunity to come in and solve the problem of the day with me. So take note of that. In some few minutes time, we are going to open the phone lines. The phone lines will be appearing on your screen so that you get the number and then you call in. When you call in, you try and then tone down or tune down the volume of your set. If you're watching by TV, you give us a very low, low, low volume and try to hear or interact with me through your phone. And then we will look at the problem of the day and then we solve the question together. But now we have a question here. It says an object is located 30 centimeters from a passenger's side mirror. So it tells you the kind of mirror we are being used or we are using or that is being used. A passenger's side mirror. Let's move on. The image formed is upright and one third the size of the object. So we give you some parameters in here. A, is the image real or virtual? B, what is the focal length of the mirror? And C, is a mirror concave or convex? This is a question that demands a very good knowledge and understanding of the concept. It isn't about just getting formally and working with, no. Rather, you have to understand the question. Very, very important. It's saying that an object is located 30 cm from a passenger's side mirror. So that is our object distance, 30 centimeters. Object distance, 30 centimeters. Then it says that the image formed is upright. Also important to note. So a mirror is forming an upright image. It's likely to be what kind of mirror? You should know. And it's one third. What is the one third doing here? One third the size of the object. It's talking about the magnification. How magnified, how big is the image? Has, is, is now smaller than the object? Is now bigger than the object? It says it's one third the size of the object. So if the image is one third the size of the object, it tells me the image has become smaller than the object. Has become smaller. Very important. All right. Now, we are asked to find or tell whether the image is real or virtual. Well, if it's a passenger's side mirror, then we can say that the mirror will be a convex mirror. And convex mirrors form virtual images. So I can say that the image is virtual. Fine. If it's virtual, what is my proof? The image distance will be a proof of whether the image is real or virtual. So get to understand this. Because we are dealing with spherical mirrors, concave and convex mirrors, and concave mirrors form both real and virtual images, whereas convex mirrors form only virtual images. In this case, when you are working, you have to state your sign convention. Very important. Sign convention. So the syllabus tells us to choose real is positive sign convention. And the real is positive sign convention. We assume that if you pick, let's say, a concave mirror, its focal length is assigned a positive value. So let me try and help you with that. before we look at solving the question. So if I have focal length for F, if it is concave, 
you give it a positive value. If it is convex, you give it a negative value. Take note, this is very important. Secondly, distances of real objects and images are positive. So, if I have real object distance, a real image distance, they are both positive. That is to say that if you find an object distance or you calculate for an image distance and the value you get is positive, then that object or that image is a real image. Otherwise, otherwise, if it is a virtual image distance or virtual image distance, if you find the object distance and the image distance and they are negative, negative, then it tells you that you are dealing with virtual objects, virtual image. So in rare, in some very un, un, unlikely or not too often cases, you can come across some images that are virtual, or you can come across some objects, some objects, especially the objects that are virtual. So you can get virtual object distance you can get virtual image distance and in this case they will be negative with the case of the focal length if you find the focal length of a mirror and you get a positive value then it is a concave mirror if you get a negative value, then it is a convex mirror. With this understanding, let us go and solve the question. The question says that the object is placed 30 cm in front of, or it is seen 30 cm from a passenger's side mirror. So I'm going to put down my parameters. I have object distance, which is 30, 30 cm. Then the image formed is one third, one third, very important, one third. And you have to get to understand why or what it means by it is one third of, one third of whatever it's talking about. So you, it's used to represent object distance. So U is 30 cm, which is a real object, so plus 30 cm. Well, let me put down my sign convention. I'm using, so using, real is positive. Sign convention. I have to write this anytime I'm going to work. It's important that you do so. Make sure that you write it. Let it be there. Very important. Don't forget about it. Don't skip it. Okay? So we are using real is positive sign convention. Using real is positive sign convention. So like it's U is plus 30 cm you go back it says that the image formed is upright and one third the size of the object so our magnification m is equal to one over three now magnification combines image distance over over distance that is to say m is equal to v over u now, because we are looking at a side mirror and it produces virtual images, when you get the ratio of V on U, 
the multiplication will become negative. So this will become minus 1 over 3. If I put these parameters in here, I'll get minus 1 over 3. is giving me V over 30. This will give me, if I should cross multiply, I'll get minus 30 is equal to 3v. Then I'll divide both sides by v by 3. I'll get minus 30 on 3 is equal to 3v on 3. Then 3s would cancel out. And I'll get v is equal to minus 30 on 3. Give me minus 10 centimeters. Don't forget the unit. Now, the question is asked us to find image distance, but we have found it. The image distance will tell us what type of image it is. So we say the image is virtual because V is negative. Or we say since V is negative, the image is virtual because the image distance is negative. Then it asks something again. It says, what is the focal length of the mirror? So now we have to go and find the focal length of the mirror. How do we find the focal length of the mirror? Okay. So focal length. F. Before I go on, let me announce the four lines because after finding the focal length and the next thing to find, you can call in and answer the problem of the day. So our phone lines are 030-221-1705. Let me take it again. 030-221-1705 or 030-221-1705. 0302211706. So either 0302211705 or 0302211706. After this, you can call in and answer the problem of the day. We start with the first question and then we go on to the last question. Any of them you want to try? You bring your solution and then we go and we try and see if you get it correct and then we also give you something nice. So, 1 over F is equal to 1 over U plus 1 over V. Mind you, we are still using real is positive sign convention. We are looking for focal length. So, 1 over F will be equal to our U was 30, then our V was minus, just what is here, 10. So, plus 1 over minus 10, like this. So, this will give 1 over F is equal to 1 over 30 minus 1 over 10. So, we can solve that one out. So, 1 on 30 minus 1 over 10. That's giving us Minus 1 over 15. So 1 over F will give me minus 1 over 15. That means F will be equal to minus 15. When we reciprocate centimeters. And that real is positive sign convention. We said that the focal length of a convex mirror is negative. And the focal length of a concave mirror is positive. Therefore, we will say the mirror, I think the C part of the question asks, it says, 
is the mirror concave or convex. The focal length we saw was minus 15. So once it's minus 15, then the C part will say the mirror is convex because the focal length is negative. So that is it. We've been able to apply the knowledge that we have to solve the question, bearing in mind how to treat concave and convex mirrors, bear in mind the types of images they form. And number four in line is 030-2211705, 030-2211705, or 030-2211706, 030-2211706. So if you've been following us, we have the problem of the day, which you can kindly, you can kindly phone, call us, and then let us together solve the problem of the day, bearing in mind all that we have gone through. And you should be able to tell us that you have a better understanding that will help you to solve the problem of the day. Very important, very important. So let's see what you have for us. 030-2211705. 030-2211706. That is it. So we will move on. I have some more questions to solve. So as we go on, if you call in or when you call in, as and when the calls come, we'll pick them up and then we will look at what you have for us. Now, this one says we should define principal axis of a concave mirror. Define principal axis of a concave mirror. Then it says an object of height two centimeters is six centimeters in front of a concave mirror. Calculate the magnification and the distance of the image produced. If the image height is 4.1 centimeters, and this is also a past question. So we can bet that in the forthcoming WASI, we're going to find some of these questions in the exams. And once you've been following us right from the onset, you should have no problem solving some of these questions. So uh, I'm talking about principal axis of a concave mirror. What is it? What is it? Well, it says that principal axis of a concave mirror is an imaginary line. That is to say that, should you pick a concave mirror now, you won't see that line that we draw in the mirror. No. It is an imaginary line. This line joins the center of the curvature to the pole of the mirror, and it's true. But it passes through the principal focus, which is F. Principal focus is F. So it is an imaginary line joining the center of curvature through the principal focus to the pole. So it's an imaginary line that joins the center of curvature to the pole of the mirror, but it passes through the principal focus. That is what we call the principal axis of a concave mirror. We can go ahead and solve the next question. It said an object of height two centimeters. So object height is two centimeters. Then this object is six cm in front of a concave mirror. So the distance between the object and the mirror is six centimeters. That would be object distance. We are asked to calculate the magnification and the distance of the image produced. So we're talking about image distance. If the image height, then we'll be given height of the image. So we can try this. Our four lines are still open, 030 
0302211706. Any of them, we are good to go with. So 0302211705 or 0302211706. So I want to put down my parameters. We'll be given object distance. So still um, I'll use real is positive. Sign convention. So I'm going to apply that. An object of height two centimeters. So height of object. So I'll use h such script zero or not two cm. So object height is two. CM, it says it is 6 cm in front of the mirror. So 6 cm is in front. And then the image produced has a height of 4.1. So the object distance, which is U, is 6 cm. And then the height of the image formed, I'll say H script I, is 4. 0.1 centimeters. We have to find two things. Magnification. Magnification, which is M. Then we have to find what else? Image distance. Image distance, which is V. So how do we do these? We are saying we are using real is positive sign convention. To find magnification, another formula for magnification, M is equal to image height on object height. image height on object height. So, we have set the ball rolling and I expect you to be able to continue from here. We've been able to look at question number 10 in the physics WASI exams. A sure bet that you could get 12 or more over 15 in that paper. In the days ahead, you'll come back again to take you through other areas you're supposed to cover before the exam is due. And then probably Albert is my name. We have we had you here on the Joy Learning Revision Show. Keep up with us here. Follow us on YouTube. Follow us on Facebook, Joy Learning TV, and we got you covered. So for now, have a good night. Thank you for being with me, and I wish you all the best. Bye bye. to revise for your WASI, then Joy Learning has everything you need in place. Yes, we are back with the 2023 revision show for SHS3 learners. Don't worry, your favorite question of the day section wasn't left out. And oh, 